Is that a microphone? There it is. Thank you, Lauren, for letting me know if the audio wasn't working. That explains why everyone was leaving. Hi, Lauren. Can you hear me now? <laughs> can you hear me now? Uh, I'm going to assume you can because now that I'm actually looking at my sound here, I can see the volume's on. Did you hear anything I had to say so far? No, of course not. It is one of those weeks. I'm going to take a sip of my coffee. We're going to take a breather for a second, and we're going to get our heads right back in the game. There it is. Thank you, Lauren, Angela. Thank you for commenting. Thank you for sticking around. Uh, I'll repeat what I said at the beginning. This has been a crazy few days for me, <laughs> uh, which is why I'm doing the weekly wrap-up right now. I'm going to sip this coffee. Shake it off. So yesterday, I if you did not hear me, which obviously you didn't, uh, I do suffer from migraines. And uh, although they become a lot less frequent as an adult, they are much more severe. And call me a crybaby if you will, but they are fairly debilitating. Luckily, they only last one day, although yesterday's lasted 12 hours instead of my usual eight. Uh, but that's why I was not available to you yesterday. It's why I didn't send out an email today. I really was dead to the world for most of yesterday. Um, and then just as I was getting started today, I had everything set up for this. And then we got trivia later. It was going to be a big fun night. And then uh, Microsoft decided to update my life. <laughs> and that's why I was 15 minutes tardy today. And I don't know why the sound was off. It turned off my mic. So now that we're good, now that we're good, let's get our heads in the game. <laughs> let's talk about the American Revolution. I do apologize for my treason. <laughs> um, and let's get it started. Today's founder is the impartial examiner number two. Uh, again, the Impartial Examiner is a series of anti-federalist papers written by an unknown Virginian attempting to get the state of Virginia to not ratify the United States Constitution. And oh boy, was it close. Now we do know Virginia does end up ratifying the Constitution, but it's still fun to look at what people were saying that was so bad about it. The Impartial Examiner, these are longer than most anti-federalist essays, and I'm going to sum it up as briefly as I can, but the main meat of the second letter of the impartial examiner discusses the general good. Now, the general good is also referred to in the Constitution itself under, you know, general welfare. And the impartial examiner is saying, well, when the separate states are responding to the citizens, they're pretty good at determining what those citizens need. But the entire country, all these 13 different states under one government, there's such an array of opinions and ideas and needs and desires of the different citizens that they will not all be able to get the maximized amount of general good out of such a large government. And in fact, the impartial examiner was afraid that the opposite effect would happen where representatives of the different states would have to fight so hard for the general good of their state that it would actually adversely affect the general good of the United States at large. He goes into a lot more detail about it than I just did, uh, but he then bounces around to a few other topics, which we've heard in discussions from other anti-federalists. Uh, he looks at the federal, federal government's ability to raise taxes. The examiner is afraid that this ability to raise taxes will uh, put citizens in a situation where they owe more money to the federal government than they actually could make. And they'd be in, essentially enslaved by this debt because not only could they not pay this off, but because there was no trial by jury, they could just be taken and imprisoned. Now, I know you might be thinking, there is trial by jury, but no, that's part of the Bill of Rights. And when these papers were written against the Constitution itself, there were no Bill of Rights. There were no First Ten Amendments, and there was no trial by jury, something many, many anti-federalists were very afraid of. Uh, in the same paper, the impartial examiner continues to talk about standing armies, and in very brief, uh, he does a long summation of it. I am doing a very short one. Um, what he really picks out about standing armies that I found interesting is uh, the examiner points out that soldiers are meant to soldier. They are meant to fight. And if there's an army full of soldiers, well, the army is going to look out for its soldiers, as it rightfully should. But what soldiers want to do is fight. And the army will be pushing the government in a direction, or at least doing its best to sway decisions to continue as many wars and hostilities as possible to give its soldiers something to soldier about. Lastly, the, in this 
second impartial examiner, the examiner goes on to review the powers of the Supreme Court. Again, we've discussed the Supreme Court with other anti-federalists, but it's worth a review. Uh, he very much doesn't like that the judicial department's uh, regulations are actually supposed to be set up by Congress. The, the judicial department still is essentially controlled by Congress, by the laws Congress makes regarding the judicial department. Uh, and the impartial examiner basically says, why isn't this outright determined in the Constitution itself? Just write down how the judicial department is supposed to work. You write down how the executive works, and you write down how the legislative works, and then you don't write down the judicial department, you just say it's up to Congress. Well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So that in, in, is a very brief overview of the impartial examiner. Make sure you hit like and subscribe. Uh, let's continue on to our next founder. We're going to breeze through because we got trivia tonight and uh, I'm packing a whole life into one night tonight. There's a motorcycle out there. Uh, you may also notice I am going to go through each one as if they are individual little shorts, kind of the way I used to film them uh, real quick <laughs> uh, back before I made some changes. So I hope you do enjoy it. It might be a little off-putting when I start talking and I say today's founder is this and do well, we're doing seven today's founders. But anyway, I hope you're enjoying it. We're going to talk about Thomas Burke. A real interesting character. Today's founder is Thomas Burke, a governor of North Carolina. Now, before he was governor of North Carolina, Thomas Burke was an Irish immigrant who, before even turning 20 years old, came to the future United States and became acting as a physician. He didn't have a medical degree. He just said he was a doctor and people believed him. You could do that back then. So Burke does this for a while. He's living in Virginia. And then when the Stamp Act gets passed, he gets a little agitated about it. And he takes up his pen and he, he writes several articles in protest of the Stamp Act. At the same time, he really starts to like not only politics, but the law. And he studies and passes the bar and becomes a lawyer. So he's a doctor and a lawyer. And it's about this time in 1774 that Thomas Burke moves over to North Carolina, where he really wants to start his life. Now, he's in North Carolina only about a year and a half by the time he's elected to the Provincial Congress, essentially the Revolutionary Assembly. A year after that, the same assembly sends him to the Continental Congress. So he's now representing North Carolina in its own government and now in Philadelphia, though he has barely spent any time in North Carolina. He's there for about five years. I'm sorry, four years in the Continental Congress, during which time he's elected the third governor of North Carolina. Again, having spent very little time of his life in North Carolina, though I do want to pause, because before he was elected governor, uh, the Continental Congress was famously chased out of Philadelphia by the British Army, and most of the delegates of the Continental Congress ran out of town. Thomas Burke, however, knew that the North Carolina militia was there and ready to attempt to halt the British from entering Philadelphia. And he actually went and served with the militia when the British were attacking. So he is the one Continental Congressman who stood up and fought for Philadelphia. Now that didn't go well. They lost Philadelphia almost immediately. And Thomas Burke does then retreat and join the rest of his, the delegates in York, Pennsylvania. Now, as I said, he does eventually get elected governor and he returns to North Carolina really for the first extended period of his life as governor of North Carolina. Burke's in North Carolina, and he, I, well, he's captured. Uh, the British raid the capital of Hill, Hillsborough, and during that time, Burke is actually the governor, is captured by the British, and he's taken to South Carolina. And on his way to South Carolina, a brigadier general named John Butler attempts to save him. And a battle breaks out called the Battle of L Lindley's Mill. Now, G General Butler ambushes the British, though it doesn't work. Yet again, he's involved with uh, uh, an attack that doesn't work, and he is uh, whisked away, away to away, as they say, uh, to an island off the coast of South Carolina, where he is kept for quite some time, but he's, al he's paroled on the island. He's allowed to walk about freely. He is unmolested. He's treated very... He's treated middlingly by the British. Again, he's allowed to walk about the island, but his nourishment isn't the best. He doesn't, he's not given the best living conditions, and eventually he escapes from the island and returns to North Carolina. Now, when he returns to North Carolina, Thomas Burke, he does write a letter to the British saying, I still consider myself on parole. I am still a prisoner. Please exchange me. But then 
he takes up his seat as governor again. And this is a real problem because Back then, these were men of honor, and if you said, I'm still on parole, you were supposed to act as if you were on parole and not resume any official duties that you would otherwise have been prohibited from while in custody. So the British don't love this, um, but fortunately, here he is not taken again. Thomas Burke remains free for the rest of the war, but... Sadly, just as the Revolutionary War is coming to an end, Burke, who at this point is only 35 years old, he's younger than I am, <laughs> it makes me sad, he's only 35 years old, and the treatment he had uh, in captivity, not just on the island, but actually uh, while being escorted to the island, had taken such an extreme adverse toll on his health that Thomas Burke passes away, again, at just 35 years old, having been a physician, a lawyer, a governor, and a revolutionary. And that is an extremely brief overview of the life of Governor Thomas Burke. I hope you enjoyed it. Definitely hit like on your way out and make sure you subscribe for American Revolution five days a week. Or hit like and don't leave. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I get in the heat of the discussion about the founder and then I forget. Whoopsie daisy. Still got more to talk about. It's one of those weeks. I'm sure you guys understand. Thank you, TJ. Thank you so much. We're talking about Edmund Pendleton. I'm going to take a quick sip of water because I'm talking a lot. I really like this new water bottle, but it looks terrible on camera. So I got to get another one. Um, thank you guys so much for hanging out. And let's talk about Edmund Pendleton. Today's founder is Edmund Pendleton, and Edmund Pendleton is an extremely interesting American founder, mostly because something he was involved in a decade before the American founding, something called the John Robinson Scandal. Now, Edmund Pendleton was 45 years old, an attorney general in the 1760s, just as the Stamp Act was getting passed uh, and other acts, including the Currency Act, which is very important to today's discussion. Because while he was 45 years old, his mentor, John Robinson, passes away. And Edmund Pendleton is the one who's chosen to uh, oversee the execution of Robinson's estate. Now, Robinson was an extraordinarily important colonial leader. He was both Speaker of the House of Burgesses, which was Virginia's Colonial Assembly, and Virginia's Treasurer. Now, you probably shouldn't hold both these positions at the same time, and we're about to find out why. You see, John Robinson and the Virginia colonial government in general, after the end of the French and Indian War, well, like most colonies, there was a little bit of a recession because war is very profitable, and ending a war isn't so profitable. Uh, especially when now they want to pay all these troops and all the other things Britain was trying to do to raise money. So... One of the things Virginia did is it printed a bunch of money to be passed around to help people pay their debts. And then the idea was after it gets passed around, it would be recollected by the treasurer who would then destroy the money so that there wouldn't be any inflation. It would inflate for a minute just to keep up with the, the, the recession and get through the recession. And then the money would be destroyed and when everything got back to normal. That was the game plan. Unfortunately, Mr. John Robinson, he didn't destroy the money. In fact, he loaned it out because even though the money was being collected, the recession hadn't really ended. And many of the wealthy elites of Virginia, well, they were heavily in debt before the war, and now they were even more in debt. So what did they do? Well, they took out more debt. And they took that debt from John Robinson. They most No one really realized that the money they were borrowing from John Robinson wasn't John Robinson's money. No, no, no. That was the Virginia currency that was supposed to be destroyed. But it wasn't destroyed. It was loaned out. Suddenly, John Robinson dies. Edmund Pendleton comes in and starts reviewing the estate. And he stumbles onto, oh man, he didn't destroy this money. He loaned it out. And suddenly word got out about that. And that essentially collapses Virginia's economy. In the mid 17, it is 1766. 
So right after the Stamp Act comes around, right about the time the Stamp Act is getting repealed, but at the same time, there's the Currency Act, which essentially says you guys can't print your own currency, which knowing this John Robinson story happening simultaneously actually makes a lot of sense from the British point of view because they didn't want exactly this to be happening. And then the colonists complain about it. And as they're complaining about it, it's happening. Uh, so Edmund Pendleton discovers this. He actually, you would think this would destroy his reputation being associated with John Robinson, but no, he handles it really well, uh, especially as Attorney General of Virginia. And additionally, he starts blaming the British government for putting them in this situation. So it is no surprise to you that a handful of years later, when the Revolu uh, American Revolution begins, when the First Continental Congress meets, Edmund Pendleton is sent to the First Continental Congress and he signs the Articles of Association and the Boycott on uh, British Imported Goods. Now, the next year, Edmund Pendleton actually goes back to the Second Continental Congress and he does a lot of great things there, but he returns to Virginia and he doesn't sign the Declaration of Independence. Instead, he becomes president of the Virginia Committee of Safety. And I want to remind you that even after the Declaration of Independence is signed, the founders really thought that the work in their home state was significantly more important than the work in the Continental Congress. It's one of the reasons the Articles of Confederation kind of fail is because no one cares to go to Philadelphia to be a part of the confederated government. They want to be home in their state governments. Uh, and Edmund Pendleton is no different. He leaves before independence, but he's president of the Virginia Committee of Safety, which kind of makes him governor in all but name uh, and puts him at the head of most of the militias. Uh, he also serves as the head of the president of the Virginia Conventions, specifically the 5th Virginia Convention, which issues Richard Henry Lee instructions to declare uh, uh, these colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. Uh, so again, he's the one who signs the letter to Richard Henry Lee, who then stands up on the floor of the Continental Congress and recommends independence. Uh, furthermore, he works with George Mason, who George Mason really wrote the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which the Bill of Rights for the Constitution would later be based on. Um, but, uh, uh, the Virginia Declaration of Rights is, Mason really wrote them, but Pendleton advised him while writing that. They were close friends. And again, by this point, Pendleton is one of the older revolutionaries and, and looked up to by a lot of the founders, especially in Virginia. Uh, Pendleton, of course, he serves, uh, as the, um, president of the Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals. It's not really chief justice of Virginia, but it's it's a high-ranking justice. Uh, court systems are complicated and different in all the revolutionary states. So I'm not going to get too into it, but a very important justice. Uh, and then he actually ends up being president of Virginia's ratification convention when the United States Constitution is ratified. And when, when John Robinson dies at the age of 82, almost uh, in 1803, almost 40 years after John Robinson died, and that whole first scandal happens, almost half of his life later, he is still finding ways to repay the John Robinson estate because his old mentor, John Robinson, had really sank that much of Virginia's wealthy elite into financial crisis that 40 years later, an entire revolution, after George Washington, John Adams, and into Thomas Jefferson's presidency, they are still paying off the debts from the John Robinson estate. So that is an extremely brief overview from one of the most, I'd say, overlooked and underappreciated leaders of revolutionary Virginia. Most of the other head guys, you might, you'll at least passingly recognize the name. I said George Mason, you know, Pat, Richard Henry Lee, Patrick Henry. These are names you've heard at least. Edmund Pendleton, a lot of people have not heard, but Pendleton is certainly one of those leaders. So please hit like if you enjoyed this video and subscribe for more American Revolution content. And you and I and all the rest of us are going to look at who's next. Joseph Jones. Joseph Jones is a good old time. I'm going to take a quick sip. Let's go with the coffee this time. We got a long night ahead of us. Anyone who's watching just popped in, you know, make sure you subscribe. We are playing trivia at 815 tonight. That's already set up and ready to go. My computer's not going to update. A second time, I, I hope. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about <clears throat> Joseph Jones. Today's founder is Joseph Jones. 
Now, Joseph Jones writes a very important letter in American history, but well before that, he was a young man in colonial Virginia who was, like many other wealthy young Virginians, sent to Europe for his education. He comes back to colonial Virginia, and he gets a law degree, and he starts being a successful lawyer, and he works in the House of Burgesses, uh, which, of course, is Ameri uh, Virginia's uh, colonial government. Now, Joseph Jones ends up joining the Patriot cause. He becomes a member of the 5th Virginia Convention, or several of the Virginia Conventions, but the 5th Virginia Convention, which was the one that recommended independence to the Continental Congress. Now, it's just about this time that his sister passes away. And his sister's husband had also passed away, which meant his nephews and nieces were orphaned. And one of these nephews is James Monroe. And 16-year-old James Monroe is now brought into Joseph Jones's house and adopted as his own son. Now, 16 years old was already pretty old at this time because uh, it would only be about a year before Joseph Jones gets James Monroe a job in the Continental Army as a very young officer who gets wounded and serves valiantly throughout the war. And then decades go by and James Monroe becomes president. And Joseph Jones had an extremely important effect on young Monroe, not only getting him this job in the Continental Army, but bringing him to Williamsburg, introducing him to famous people, uh, or, or no respectable people, I suppose I should say, uh, gets him into the College of William and Mary, and just really mentors him throughout his adulthood, uh, which really is the most notable thing in Joseph Jones's life, his, his mentorship of James Monroe, who, of course, would be the fifth president of these United States of America. Now, Jones himself would be sent to the Continental Congress. He, he went in 1777. He only hung out for a few months because he got sick and he returned home as people uh, would do. Now, about this time, he starts a regular correspondence with George Washington, uh, again, as a Virginian in the Continental Congress, talking to Commander-in-Chief George Washington was a very important business. Uh, but they continue their correspondence when he goes back home. A few years later, Jones returns to the Continental Congress, and this time he would sit for about three years in the Continental Congress, and it's during this time that he writes an extremely important letter to George Washington. Now, I'm going to jump up to George Washington here because you probably heard this story, but it's one of the best stories in the American Revolution, and it's worth retelling over and over again. You see, after the Battle of Yorktown, George Washington takes his Continental Army up to Newburgh, New York, which is just outside New York City, and they sit there for like a year and a half, waiting for the British to evacuate Manhattan so they could walk back into New York City, officially say we did it, and go home. Now, while they're in Newburgh, well, the, the, the army gets restless. Specifically, the officers in the Continental Army get restless. And there's a little bit of questions about what they actually say and what they actually want to do. But they're asking, hey, we've spent eight years fighting this war. And all these merchants and doctors and lawyers are in Philadelphia really screwing things up. Maybe we should go over there with our weapons and tell them what to do. George Washington famously goes out, he tells them to have a meeting, guys. You guys have a meeting and sort it out. And they're like, okay. And then who walks in the door? George Washington. He didn't say he'd be at the meeting. He just told us we should go to the meeting. And Washington walks into the meeting and he gets up on stage and he pulls out a letter and he looks at it and he, he can't read it. It's a letter from the Continental Congress, but he can't read it. And he utters his famous line, You'll permit me to put on my spectacles. I'm going to paraphrase because, of course, I can't quote in the heat of the moment. Permit me to put on my spectacles as I've grown not only gray but nearly blind in service of my country. Please, in the comments, correct the... My, <laughs> give me the actual quote. Uh, and, and George Washington famously puts on his glasses and then reads the letter. And then he walks out of the room. And by the time he's done with the letter, this room full of hardened generals and officers of the Continental Army are all teary-eyed because they had forsaken themselves and what they were fighting for and the republic they wanted, except Timothy Pickering, who stuck to his guns and said, that's all it takes, uh, and Washington leaves. And why am I telling you this story? Oh, that's right. Because the letter, the letter he was reading in this extremely famous story was a letter written to him by Joseph Jones the adopted father of James Monroe, who was representing Virginia in the Continental Congress. And that, my friends, is probably the most important moment of Joseph Jones's life. A letter he wrote to George Washington that George Washington couldn't read. I hope you're enjoying these stories. If you do, definitely hit like uh, and subscribe because I'm talking about the American Revolution five days a week. Uh, you guys, if you have any questions, I am here. It is a live video, even though I'm 
going into each founder and getting through them before I answer any questions. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Uh, and who's the next founder we're going to talk about? John Alsop. Aesop. I believe it's pronounced Aesop. It's got to be Aesop. Am, am I right? Am I right? Let me take a quick sip of water because I'm talking a lot with my totally out of place water bottle. <laughs> All right. Although it does kind of match John Aesop's colors. Okay. Let's do it. Today's founder is John Aesop. Now, I want to take a quick note before we talk too much about Aesop and say, I put a lot of research into this man, and there is a question that I ran into of whether or not he was a loyalist. And it's interesting because the only place I find him being called a loyalist is in the Columbia printing of the Alexander Hamilton letters. Everywhere else, he's never listed as a loyalist. Now, I did put this out there, and I, I was talking uh, publicly with J.L. Bell on Twitter, who, who brought to my attention the idea that sometimes people were referred to as loyalists, even if they didn't go out and fight as loyalists or actually side with the British. If you simply stepped away from the revolution, then you were a loyalist in some people's minds. Now, I don't think that's fair, especially for John Aesop. So let's talk about his life. Now, he was a wealthy New York merchant who came from a fairly a middling family, but he and his brother had started a merchant firm and became very successful. Uh, and by the time the 1770s roll around, John Aesop is one of the most outspoken people in New York City about British taxation. As things become heating up, uh, he gets appointed to the Committee of Correspondence in New York, uh, an extremely important position at the time, and he joins the Committee of 60, which was one of the revolutionary governments that were taking over the Revolutionary War as things go down. Now, he ends up standing out so much as a leader uh, that he is actually chosen by New York to go to the First Continental Congress. And while at the First Continental Congress, he signs the Continental Association, which is the boycott on British goods and the result of the First Continental Congress. Now, he is looked at as such an important member of the First Continental Congress that when he returns six months later to the Second Continental Congress, he is signed up as part of the Secret Committee. Now, the Secret Committee, I'll remind you, was made up of a bunch of people from the Second Continental Congress who were supposed to negotiate with foreign countries to get supplies for the American Revolution and just to get support in general. Famously, Ben Franklin is a member of the Secret Committee. He is the one who sends Silas Dean over as the first envoy to France to try and buy supplies from the French, whether or not the French government acknowledges it, at least get some supplies from French merchants with the French government, at the very least, looking the other way. And they successfully do this. It's also the Secret Committee that ends up sending Benjamin Franklin himself to France. They're also the ones who end up sending John Adams to Europe as well. John Aesop is one of the inaugural members of the Secret Committee. It is arguably the most important committee of the Continental Congress. Now, when they send Silas Dean over, well, he's under the guise of a merchant, not only practicing his own merchant, but working as an agent for another firm. And that firm is called Mrs. Alsop and Company, M-E-S-S-R-S, -S -S, period. I think it's Mr's, but I think you pronounce it Mr's, but Mr's Alsop and Company. Aesop and Company. I don't know why I call him Alsop. It was a joke I put in my head and I keep saying it. Anyway, the name of the fake company that was used as a disguise for the Americans to go to France in secret and buy supplies was put under John Alsop's, Aesop's name. He was the de facto president of this fake company that the Patriot cause was using to get supplies from international friends. He's not just another guy at the Second Continental Congress. He's an extremely important asset to funding the war itself. Now, why, you ask? Do people consider him a loyalist? Well, as I said, most people don't. It, it's just in the footnotes of the Columbia printing of the Alexander Hamilton papers, which I'm not very happy about, because John Aesop is in the Continental Congress when the vote for independence takes place. Now, in July, on July 2nd, 1776, when the vote for independence is had, New York abstains because they are still waiting for further instructions from their home state. 
the delegates, as I have mentioned a hundred times in this channel, the delegates of the Continental Congress thought their states were more important than the Continental Congress itself. And therefore, they did not do anything unless they were specifically instructed by their states to do so. In fact, uh, the vote on independence itself had already been pushed back, while other colonies at this point waited further instructions. New York abstained from voting on, on July 2nd with the rest of the uh, Continental Congress because they had not received further instructions. Now, when New York did get those instructions just days later, New York does vote for independence. John Aesop does not. He, like several other people, notably John Dickinson, thought it was preemptive to make this decision. Uh, there was no government in place to take over. Uh, it was, you were throwing off the most powerful nation in the world. It was good to be British. And John Aesop decides to resign his position in the Continental Congress instead of vote for independence. He's there for the vote of independence. He knows there's going to be independence. He thinks he's better served going back home. And he does. He resigns and goes back home. And though he does participate in raising some more money and troops for the cause, because he didn't vote for independence, because he, he didn't vote against it, he just resigned instead, he is now a questionable character in many people's minds. And certain people at the time may have referred to him as a loyalist, but if he was really a loyalist, like other members of the First Continental Congress from New York, Isaac Lowe, a member of the First Continental Congress, ends up being a loyalist and going back to New York City once the British take over. John Aesop doesn't go to New York City for the protection of the British. Instead, his house in Queens is burned down by the British, and then his house in New York City is taken by the British, and he goes to live with friends and family in Middletown, Connecticut. And he spends the duration of the war in Connecticut under the protection of the Patriots, not the protection of the British. And then, once the British evacuate at the end of the war and leave forever, then Johnny Aesop returns to New York City and is almost immediately elected president of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, he's already getting up there in age, but in the mid-1780s, his daughter Mary actually marries Rufus King, another extremely important Federalist, later would be the last Federalist candidate for President of the United States. Again, Rufus King probably wouldn't be marrying into a Loyalist family if he wants to advance his career as a New York City merchant, especially because Rufus King was originally from Massachusetts, so he just got to New York, he's trying to make his name there. Yeah, I point most of this out to demonstrate, and, and one last thing to demonstrate, uh, that he was not a loyalist. Uh, when he passes away in 1794, he's actually looked at fondly by many people. In fact, I read uh, a letter from John Adams. Uh, I can't remember who he was writing to, but John Adams had said, we've lost so many of our original worthies. And he lists the names of people who died in the early 1790s who were worthies of the revolution. And John Aesop is one of those people that John Adams had met at the First and Second Continental Congress, that John Adams worked with on the secret committee to establish the trains and routes of getting supplies from Europe to the Continental Army. I may have got a little tangent for such an obscure founder. I usually don't go this deep on them, but I was so um, disappointed by the treatment of John Aesop being casually named a loyalist that I really kind of made it my mission today and this week when I published this article to verify that no, John Aesop was an important American revolutionary who simply uh, did not think it was time for independence. Again, other names like John Dickinson has overcome the, I, the voting against independence or, or not even voting against, abstaining from the vote on independence or resigning instead of voting on independence. John Aesop apparently hasn't overcome that because he's not nearly as famous a founder. But thank you for watching this video and thank you for agreeing with me that this man was not a loyalist. <laughs> anyway, uh, definitely hit like and subscribe and let me know if you have any questions in the comments. Uh, I did see something come in. Misfit, uh, give me the full quote. Thank you, Misfit. Uh, Gentlemen, you will permit me to put on my spectacles, for I have not only grown gray, but almost blind in service of my country. I was very close. I was very, very close. You will permit me to put on my spectacles is on a t-shirt on my website. I think it's the funniest. It's one of the most important lines ever uttered in American history, but like, I don't know. You see someone with a shirt that says, permit me to put on my spectacles. You're like, who's the nerd that said that? It's like, oh, George Washington <laughs> after winning a war. <laughs> One of my favorite quotes. And I was pretty close because I'm not good at quoting things. 
Okali Dokali Doo. Who is the next founder on our list? We got two more. Oh, Willie Williams. Willie Williams. Oh, the motorcycles are out. Sorry about that, guys. I need to fix my soundproofing. It blew off or something. Willie Williams. Okay. I, I, I stretch out. <laughs> Getting ready. Excuse me. All right. Today's founder is William Williams, a signer of the Declaration of Independence. Now, Willie Williams, as I like to call him, I, he was uh, from Connecticut. And by the 1770s, he had already married into the Trumbull family. And of course, one of the Trumbulls was a longtime governor of Connecticut, the only governor uh, to both be a royal governor and then continue on as a patriotic patriot governor. Um, he also has, uh, he's a town clerk, he's a church deacon, he, uh, Williams is a militia colonel, he's on the town councils, he serves on a bunch of committees, he's just a doing everything for his town kind of guy. And that's why, once the British start doing some taxing he doesn't like, he writes a few papers to, you know, publish in the local newspapers, and, uh, talk about why everything's so terrible that the British are doing. Because of this, he uh, it becomes a real leader in his community. In fact, when the Battle of Lexington and Concord breaks out, William Williams, uh, he actually donates a lot of his own money to raise troops to go support neighboring colony of Boston. And he walks from house to house getting money from his neighbors to support them. Uh, because of this, he's seen as a uh, uh, an important revolutionary. And he's sent to Philadelphia to join the Second Continental Congress. He is there to replace the ailing Oliver Wolcott. Don't worry, Wolcott gets better. But he gets there after independence has been voted for. He has nothing to do with independence. He shows up a little bit late because someone else got sick. And he gets there just in time to be to see everyone signing it. And William Williams says, hey, I know I wasn't here for this, but can I sign that? And they're like, yeah, man, go ahead. And Willie Williams gets his name on the his John Hancock, if you will, on the Declaration of Independence right under John Hancock. Now, William Williams sticks around for a while. He's actually appointed the committee that drafts the Articles of Confederation. Now, of course, the Articles of Confederation originally are mostly John Dickinson's handiwork, but once Dickinson leaves because uh, he doesn't want to vote for independence, a committee takes over, and William Williams is one of the people that finalizes the Articles of Confederation, which, you know, doesn't work out, but is extremely important as the first government of the United States of America. Now, uh, he returns home after uh, the... the Articles of Confederation. Uh, he's back in Connecticut for a while, and then the ratification of the Constitution comes up. And William Williams goes to the Connecticut Ratification Convention, and he's there as an Anti-Federalist. And he votes against it for a reason that our modern ears might not love. He doesn't like the Constitution because there's no religious test. Now, I'll remind you, many other founders were very upset that they're was nothing prohibiting religious tests, and the First Amendment in the Bill of Rights a few years later would specifically say freedom of religion was a very important thing. William Williams actually believed, again, of the many things he had done earlier in life, he had trained as a deacon, as, as a minister for a while, and he thought religion was necessary for the character of a man, uh, 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 or, or a leader, I should say, although he would have said man, I will say leader. Uh, he thought that to be a real a leader in this particular type of nation, you needed to be able to pass a certain amount of questioning regarding your religious beliefs and your understanding of religion, because that not only spoke to your character, but your understanding of how the United States government should work. Again, he wasn't really against the Constitution itself. He was against the idea that there was no religious test. I'll remind you that at this point, and, and for years, for, for 30 years after the Constitution was signed, Connecticut still had a state religion. Uh, and, you know, one of the reasons there's the, the Bill of Rights has freedom of religion uh, is to make sure the federal government can't have one national church. But that doesn't prohibit the individual states from having state churches. And Connecticut did for a long, long, long time. Uh, and being from such a pious state as Connecticut, it, you can kind of see where William Williams would be coming from with his feeling of the need of a religious test. Now, I will say, despite these reservations and despite coming at the convention as an anti-federalist, uh, William Williams does actually change his mind and decide that this one little thing that apparently everyone disagreed with him on, not everyone, but a majority of founders were like, 
angry for the opposite reason. He throws his hands in the air and he says, okay, and he decides to vote for the United States Constitution uh, and help ratify, help Connecticut ratify the United States Constitution. And then he essentially retires, I'll put in quotes, uh, to the position of county judge. And he spends the next, the last 20 years of his life as a local county judge in the state of Connecticut in the nation that he helped build. So that is a brief overview of the life of William Williams. Uh, definitely hit like and subscribe for American Revolution five days a week. All right, and we're getting close to trivia. So we've got one more founder to pound out. And this guy, for those of you who play trivia and were there last week when we missed by two names, one of those names was Samuel Livermore. So please, if you plan on playing trivia in about 15 minutes, remember Samuel Livermore. He's a, he's a guy who is one of the two names we forgot. Livermore. <laughs> okay. Now, not a lot about him. It's part of the reason. But I did find some stuff, so let's talk about it. Okay. Today's founder is Samuel Livermore. Samuel Livermore is a low-level founder from uh, New Hampshire, although let me rephrase that. He was born in Massachusetts, went to college in New Jersey, at the College of New Jersey that we now know as Princeton, and then made his life in New Hampshire. And uh, he's not there too long. You know, he, he establishes a law practice and then is elected to the Colonial Assembly. Uh, during this time, he's actually spends five years as uh, New Hampshire's Attorney General. So he makes his way up, and he's a pretty important guy in the New Hampshire. Now, he is a respected leader of his adopted state when the Revolutionary War breaks out. And he's actually sent to the Continental Congress on two occasions. And probably the most interesting thing about his time in the Continental Congress is he's appointed, as it says next to me, chairman of the Grand Committee. Now, I don't think I've talked enough on this channel about the Grand Committee. Essentially, what the Grand Committee was is, you know, like any other body, the Continental Congress had several committees that did several things. And the Grand Committee was the most important because the Grand Committee consisted of one person from each colony and later state uh, in the Union. So there were 13 people on the Grand Committee. And all the difficult decisions that would have caused too much commotion and debate in the Continental Congress itself would be put to the Grand Committee to decide and make a recommendation to send back to the Continental Congress. And Livermore is the New Hampshire delegate on the Grand Committee in 1782. Uh, and he is the chairman of the Grand Committee, overseeing these really important discussions that the Continental Congress itself couldn't decide. And there are two major things I found that happened while Livermore was on the Grand Committee. First of all, the committee has to discuss whether or not Vermont should be admitted as a state in the Union. Again, this is back in 1782. It was almost a decade before Vermont actually gets admitted. Spoiler alert, they don't get admitted. But the Grand Committee, led by Samuel Livermore, recommends that Vermont does get admitted into the Union all the way back in 1782, just after the Battle of Yorktown, because it's obviously going to happen. And it would settle a lot of disputes between New York, New Hampshire, and the people actually living in the region. Uh, and what Livermore and the Grand Committee recommend is, hey, if we have five, uh, if Vermont agrees to these borders that we've decided, and they send two representatives immediately to sign the Articles of Confederation, then they can get in. And there's a date, I forget the exact date, but they essentially say, if they get it, they get two people here by this date and sign the Articles of Confederation, we'll let them in. Because Articles of Confederation took a while. It had been, at this point, less than a year since Maryland had signed them, and they became official. Just to put some context into when what they're talking about now. Now, again, uh, it doesn't make... Uh, that actually goes back to the Continental Congress, because, again, the Grand Committee, as important as it is, is only a committee. The Continental Congress needs to vote, and the Continental Congress votes it down. Uh, I don't remember all the states, but New York and uh, was able to get Virginia to side with it, and those two got a few more states to coalesce and vote against it, because New York, again, really thought Virginia was... Uh, I really thought Vermont was part of New York. But to be fair, Livermore's home state of New Hampshire thought it was part of New Hampshire, which is very interesting how he was the one making this recommendation. <clears throat> Secondly, the Continental Congress was always having trouble raising money. They, the states were supposed to chip in as best they could, and they all came to agreements on how much they should chip in. Some states just didn't do it. So Livermore leading the Grand Committee 
made a recommendation that commissioners be set up, 13 commissioners be chosen as the people to go, not members of the Continental Congress, outside men to go and actually get the money from the states and say, you owe this money and go around as essentially the very tax collectors that were being rebelled against in the first place in most scenarios. Now, this, again, it kind of seems reasonable because the Continental Congress needs this money. Like, they're broke. They need to pay these soldiers who have been fighting for eight years. We just won Yorktown. We need this money, guys. And Livermore's recommendation from the Grand Committee again goes to the Continental Congress, and again, they vote it down. Uh, the decision with the Continental Congress is actually to have a few commissioners and, and work more directly with the states, and it would never work anyway, so it doesn't matter. Now, Livermore, and I, it doesn't, I could not find anywhere that this is the exact reason Livermore was taken away from his position or whether he resigned, but he kept having his recommendations voted down. And it was only about two months later that he was replaced as president of the committee by George Clymer. He wasn't taken off the committee, he was replaced as president, someone whose recommendations might actually be listened to by the Continental Congress. Now, this is not the end of Livermore's story. He actually. He does go back to New Hampshire, where he spends most of the 1780s as Chief Justice of New Hampshire. Pretty important guy. And then the United States Constitution is ratified, and Livermore is chosen as an inaugural member of the United States House of Representatives. And he's in the House of Representatives for the first two sessions of Congress under the George Washington administration. That's four years before he's elected to the United States Senate. And while he's in the United States Senate, he spends seven years there. He's elected, he spends throughout the Washington and Adams administration, he's re-elected, but then due to ill health in 1801, he resigns, because he is approaching 70 years old, he's not feeling well, and he would go home to New Hampshire and only live another two years before he passes away, but I find this guy fascinating now that I've dug into him. I hope you do too. That is a brief overview of the life of Samuel Livermore. So... When we play trivia tonight, I need you guys to remember this name. Now, trivia is in about 10 minutes. For those of you who just tuning in, uh, I'm sorry it's been a crazy week, and I did my weekly wrap-up first, and we're going to be trivia. It is going to be on another channel. I've already set that up, so if you guys want to click over there, I am going to call it now. It's in about 10 minutes. I'm going to take a little bit of a break, take a breather, walk around the house, <laughs> and then we're going to have a lot of fun. So I'll pull myself back up here. I want to say thank you guys for your patience this week. Like I said, I was sick yesterday, so this video got moved to today before trivia. Uh, for those of you tuning in uh, who are new here, we talk about the American Revolution all week long, play trivia on Fridays. So uh, definitely subscribe, bounce over to that. That is already set up. I'll be there in just a few minutes. Um, I am very gracious that you guys are hanging out. Uh, Livermore, it's a town near me. Great, Troy, we need it. We missed by two last week. Uh, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, anyone new here, uh, American Revolution trivia, we end by trying to name 243 American founders, and we have twice hit 241. So we need those last two. One of them is Livermore. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you, TJ. I'm feeling better. I, you know, I get migraines, and they, um, uh, uh, they, they only last a day. I'm fine. They just are kind of debilitating, which is why, as Troy might have recognized, there was no email today, uh, which I... Disappointed because there's no Anti-Federalist Friday, which is so much fun. Uh, although I do say Troy likes these interviews. Thank you so much. I do appreciate that. Uh, I have more scheduled for next week. I did have to cancel one yesterday because I was dead to the world. Um, but I have a few ideas for videos when I don't have interviews. I, I do love having the interviews. And I want to try and do three a week. I really love the interviews, but I'm definitely going to do at least two a week. Um... Uh, but I had a few ideas. I, I, I actually, I think on uh, Monday, I might do Mondays where I go through, I'm going to go through the first Continental Congress by state or colony at the time um, and talk about that. So I'm going to start like they would have done with New Hampshire, talk about the two delegates from New Hampshire, the first Continental Congress and their relationship a little bit and what happens there. Then I'll move down to Massachusetts, Rhode Island, yada, yada. So if you guys think that's fun, uh, let me know in the comments. Uh, I am going to go right now. I'm going to kind of run away on you. <laughs> And I'll be back in nine minutes uh, over on the other video, which I set up separately because, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and not all the people who want to watch the weekly wrap-up want to watch the trivia and vice versa. So I figured I'd just separate it. Um, but thank you so much, Troy. I really appreciate that. The interviews are really fun. And, um, you know, I think we'll see some people coming back who have been here before, talk about them a little more. Um, and I hope to uh, get some new people.
who have written books and such and learn as much as I can from them. This is all I'm trying to do is suck knowledge from other people. <laughs> Pass it on to you guys. You suck it from me. I'll suck it from them. I realize what I'm saying sounds worse than it is. Anyway, uh, I'm going to go. Uh, thank you a thousand times. I guess I will say round bottom now and we'll have brain tree later. So round bottom guys, I will talk to you in just a few minutes.